Warning, this episode contains strong language. It is August 23rd, 2016. I am Jessica Alouette, and I use she, her. And I'm Mark Hanna, I use he, him. So, episode 12, not a prime number, sorry to disappoint you, Mark. Well, we're getting close to the next one, so it's okay. Okay, so we're going to... And 12's a cool number, but don't get me started on math stuff, that's not the topic. Um, <laughs> but that's also episode 13, which, as we know, is... It's, it's cool. It, it's, it's no, great. it's cursed. It's cursed. No, episode eleven was cursed. We've got past that. Oh yeah, that's right. We okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maybe eleven's the real unlucky number. <laughs> we've been we had it wrong the whole time. Everyone, stop the superstitions. Being a D and D player, I'm just going to say that one is the unlucky number because I hate it when I roll a one. Okay. Now I have to ask you this. Okay. What is the worst thing that's happened to you when you've rolled a one? I've died. <laughs> that's it. That's it? Like, it doesn't get much worse, really, than dying. Okay. Funniest thing that happened when you rolled oh, a one. Um... Uh, by the way, welcome to our show. Uh, we talk about video games, but now we're talking about Dungeons & Dragons, because that's a game. Different game. What is the funniest thing that's happened to me when I've rolled a one? Come on, you got nothing? A lot of the ones that I'm thinking of are just like fumbles, which aren't really that funny. I know some stuff that's happened by chance in D&D that hasn't been the result of a roll of a one. Like my, okay, cousin's, I'll take that. my cousin's character who um, has all these sort of wild magic surges. A couple of sessions ago, he spontaneously grew bunny ears. <laughs> and they turned oh. out to be permanent. Oh no! So we weren't sure for a while. We've managed to fix it without too much bloodshed. Uh, um, too much? Well, he did it with a magic person instead of a surgeon. <laughs> um, no. But yeah, there's a few oh, things like that. No. Wild magic is great for, for funny stuff happening in D&D. Fantastic. Um, Mark, what non-tabletop games have you been playing this week? So I, I haven't actually played as much this week as I have more recently. I haven't touched Starbound, and I think I've done one session of Monster Hunter. But I have um, picked up Diablo 3 again, um, which I've done a few times since it came out. I mean, I got it soon after release initially and sort of didn't get as into it as I'd hoped. But I've come back to it a few times because they, they changed it quite significantly sometime after release. And now they do a thing called Seasons which is basically you start a new character for that season. You've got a bunch of objectives you're supposed to do. And as you fill all those out, you get a complete um, set of really powerful items that like together to give you a special class bonus that changes the play style quite a lot. So different sets are available for each season and I'll play a different class each time and then try something new. So that's pretty fun. Um, And we'll get more into that in a bit, but what have you been playing this week? Uh, this week I've been playing The Last of Us. I have been... Nice, solid choice. Yeah, I finished it last night. I um, have not finished that game. <laughs> I I discovered I had a little bit of a problem after I finished it. We'll get back to that. Yeah. Um, I have been playing more Persona 4. I've been playing more... Um... That was the PS Vita game, right? Yep. Nice right. little turn-based uh, PlayStation Vita game. Uh, formerly on the PlayStation 2, considered a pretty... Uh, considered a classic, oh, so I would say. I didn't realize Persona 4 was an old game that had been ported. I thought it was a new yeah, one for no, the Vita. It was, it was originally 07, I want to say. Isn't, uh, didn't the PS3 come out in 06, though? It might have. Maybe it was earlier. Maybe okay. I'm just like misremembering this. Because remember you told but, me that Persona 5 is coming out, what, next February? Yeah, so I assume that Persona 4 Valentine's was like this Day. year or something. Yeah, it's that's the only reason I remember the month. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, okay, so Persona 4 was released 2008. Okay. 
and um, the Vita version was released in 2012, mm -hmm. right near when the Vita launched. Right. Jesus, so, that long ago. It was a bit of a system seller. It definitely was what sold the system for me. Yeah. So, like, that's that whole situation. Well, I mean, you're the only person who's ever bought a PS Vita. This is true. I'm the one person who bought a Vita. It's weird. It's amazing they still make them. Yeah, they, mean, and they keep making games just for me. How lovely. But, you, but you're not even buying them. Like, do these just go into landfill? <laughs> they go into the digital wasteland. <laughs> oh, no. All this, a graveyard of bits and bytes. <laughs> um, so I'm playing the only PS Vita ever seen. As seen on TV. Um, as only seen on TV, on TV once when, the, the when Sony could afford to uh, purchase an advertisement for it. Oh, and uh, that one time it was in House of Cards for some reason. <laughs> um, I've also been playing this week some a little bit of Call of Duty. Uh, and I've been playing, I don't know if I talked about this, I played this game called Reigns. Like Reigns on a Horse? Like reigns, like reigns of a king. Oh, like to reign, yes, like to the reign of a monarch. R e i g n s. Yep. Okay. Like that, she reigns, sort of yep. thing. Yep. Okay. I've been I've been playing that, and that is a good time. So, what's this game? What's this game this, like? This game, um, this game is a game presented entirely through a series. of of cards, uh, like a, and each each like, card has a an event on it. So we can say one card uh, has a picture of one of your leaders in the court, and they say, "Oh, um, this village is like threatening to attack us. Should we send the army?" Uh, and you are offered a choice of yes or no by swiping. Or moving your controller or moving your mouse left or right. So you say it uses cards, but this isn't the sort of game where you have a hand that you draw from when you play cards or anything no, like that. No, this is, is like one card at a time drawing from the deck. Okay, oh, so cards is only a visual thing. Mm hmm. Right, okay. So, and uh, with all of these things, mm -hmm. there's four meters that you have to keep in check uh, there is the church, the people, the army, and your finances. Um, okay, so it's a resource management game. Sort of. Uh, because you can let resources run out, sure. And there's various ways that you will die when that happens. <laughs> so if you if you run out of money, mm -hmm. uh, you will get a card that says uh, that all the, all the nobility just owns everything. Uh, and the new oligarchy uh, damns you to exile. Whoops. Yep. But, okay, so they can run down, right? And that's one That's one aspect of this. Mm -hmm. You also cannot let them get too high. But there's a if problem you, with having too much money? There's a problem with having too much money. Uh, in this case, we're so rich. Let's throw a big feast and we'll buy the most expensive food we can. Just because we can. Because we're rich. What's uh, wrong? So you do that. And you eat so much that you, and then you choke on something and die. That's, oh, that's disappointing. That's the end. Uh, if you let the church get too powerful, I've seen this one happen. The um, Pope takes too much and dies. No, the Pope <laughs> takes control of your uh, city, your town or city or kingdom. And... So is this specifically a um, medieval? Um, yeah. um, Very what's the word I'm looking for? European, kind of like, thing. with the church being the Catholic church specifically then? Yep. Okay. It is a very European medieval kind of game. Mm -hmm. uh, it's real simple to play. It's got a charming art style. What's the uh, art style like? Very simple, kind of very, like, extreme low poly, I would call it. Okay. Uh, illustrated extreme low poly. Uh, that it's it is a lot of fun. I would recommend it. It costs three whole dollars on Steam. Oh, it's an indie game, right? 
Yep, uh, published by uh, Devolver Digital. Oh, wow, I see what you mean. It's like um, a little abstract almost. Yeah, it's real nice. So I, I would I would recommend this game because I'm having a blast with it. It's got some fun, weird, wild stuff in there. Uh, get to the year 666, something very interesting happens. What year do you start on? You start in six early 600s, I want to say, maybe late 500s. Okay. So it doesn't so you're take roll very for a long, long. time. Hmm? So you're going to roll for a long time. Oh, no, no, no. It, you continue on through generations. So oh. as, as you die as one king, then you are replaced by another king. Always a king? Always a king. Okay. That's, it's, it's disappointed me too, but yeah. I can live with it for a game. I, I can't help but um, be reminded of the game Kingdom, which I picked up uh, a couple of months ago, which is another indie game. That has a uh, similar narrative bent in a way. Like the gameplay is also very simple, but but quite different. You start off as a monarch fleeing whatever, probably monsters, and then um, only by picking up and dropping coins do you interact with the world. But like you're saying, hey, buy a bow, you go get this bow, then right. they go off and do stuff. Okay. Um, but at least in that game, I really like the art style too. It's um, really nice pixel art, but at least in that one, you can be a king or a queen. Although mm. it's not entirely clear how you pick. It sort of randomizes each time. You can change it manually, but you wouldn't right. know unless you're mashing keys while respawning. It's really interesting in um, Reigns as well. As you kind of have certain events happen, mm -hmm. uh, like you recruit someone new into your court, you get a new deck of cards to go with it. Okay. So it very much expands like that. And uh Yeah, I'm I'm really into I'm really into rains. Cool. Give it a look if you can spare a couple dollars to throw down on a game like that. Um so that's that's what I've been playing this week. Cool. So I might jump back onto Diablo three then and, and talk about that a little bit. So it's not a super new game. Um, what I've done in the past is when they start a new season, I'll start a new character and my flatmate will start a new character and we'll play through it together, which is a fair bit of fun. It's If you don't care about the story, which I don't now that I've played through it a couple of times anyway, um, mm -hmm. it's quite easy to multitask playing it. Like last night I was listening to a podcast we both like, Sawbones, which uh, this is going to sound like it won't work, but it really does. It is a medical history comedy podcast. Um, but it's really good, Sawbones, you should check it out. But I was listening to that while playing it, because you can multitask quite easily. And normally I'd be playing it with my flatmate, but it turns out that not only is Diablo 3 an online, always online game, despite being able to be played multiplayer, uh, sorry, single player, it also is really, really bad at handling a poor connection strength. Mm -hmm. So we've got fiber internet here. We've got really nice speeds, but in my flatmate's room, it's quite far from the router. It's got low signal strength, so the ping is awful. And some other multiplayer games you can play just fine. Diablo 3 is not one of them. Like, if I'm playing on my laptop in his room versus playing in the lounge downstairs, it is a massive difference. Um, so that was really annoying. So I'm playing through this one on my own. Um with actually the, the class that I played when I first played through it. But due to the the um, significant changes they've done, it now it's fairly easy to get to max level, and it kind of feels like up until max level is kind of the tutorial type thing, because only once you're at max level have you unlocked all the available skill variants you can pick from. And then it's just a pinata, a digital pinata, and that's more fun. <laughs> Um, it's fun to whack things until shiny things fall out. Well, that's why I play Call of Duty. It's very much a digital pinata. Yeah. Borderlands is one too, I guess. Uh, yeah. But this, this, this online only thing. Comes out. Yeah. Well, hopefully shiny shit at least. Well, yeah, shiny shit. But, <laughs> but yeah, this online only thing is, is a pain because now that I'm playing it on my own, it's this sort of constant reminder every now and then. 
because I'm not playing it downstairs. I'm typically playing it in my room, which has got a floor between me and the router. Sometimes the ping will drop for a bit and I'm playing on my own, but like I'll click and then a second later, the thing will come out that I've shot. So that's really annoying. And it sort of reminded me of some other online only stuff that's bugged me in the past. I think I've told you this story. There's, um, I quite like the Splinter Cell franchise. Mm-hmm. It's sort of um, sneaking games. Um, well, I played them sneaking. But the most recent one, Blacklist, when I got that, um, I actually played some already with my brother because it's it had co-op on his PS4. And I got it on PC just before we went away um, over the Christmas break um, to our family batch where we don't have an internet connection unless we're tethered to our phones. So, of course, I'm playing a single-player game, um, so I don't want to tether to my phone turn my phone's data on and do it for that. So I was playing offline. Okay, that was a pain because then it runs through Uplay, which does, does really not handle offline play gracefully. I think I had to connect to my phone to start up Uplay and then I could stop it and play the game. But the real problem came when I found out after a good long, like four hour session of this game, that if you're playing offline, which you can do, I wasn't like exploiting a bug or anything, you can play it offline but if you do that it won't save your progress so you can imagine when you've just done like four hours and you're told it didn't save your progress you don't want to do it again so i haven't actually gone back to the game since then (laughs) but i got in touch with ubisoft to say hey this is a really serious bug if anyone's playing a game offline it won't save their progress and when they got back to me do you know what they said they said it's intended to be that way it's not a bug. It's a feature that it won't save your game, which is the most bizarre thing, right? I wouldn't. I wouldn't call that a feature, but I no. would say that uh, working as intended would be probably That's the essentially what that they said. Here. Yes, um, but yeah, as intended and not saving progress shouldn't be the same thing. I agree to to a point. To a point. Um, and at, at, what, at which point should not saving progress be standard? Uh, if you are playing an MMO, say. Doesn't that just save progress as you go, though? Isn't that the idea with I, MMOs? I, I think that would depend on the MMO. Um, Destiny or The Division may not operate on kind of the same terms uh, but, as but, your World of Warcraft and stuff right, like that, Right, so, but I wouldn't call them MMOs as much. Destiny maybe a bit, but... They don't have persistent worlds. They're more episodic, match-based games. Oh, no, no. Destiny has a persistent world. and well, so It has a persistent hub. The Division right? is a persistent world, then. Okay. Yep. That, that's got a persistent world. But doesn't that save as you play? I think it saves every couple minutes. Okay. See, so, that's saving your progress. Well, if, it, if you go offline... Well, if you're, okay, if you're playing an online game offline... Fair enough, but this game is an offline is not an online game. Yeah, like I'd played it only either local co-op or single player. I've had a um, I've I've had a similar problem with one of my games. Yeah. Recently, uh, I have. Uh, I've sung the praises of the new Hitman, hither and yon, and uh, you can just. You can go back to some of our previous episodes if you want to hear me talk a little bit about Hitman. Um, In general, though, my thoughts are very good. Uh, This new Hitman game, though, it is always online because that serves a lot of the live content, like the uh, elusive targets, which are uh, characters who appear for a limited amount of time. Uh, You have one chance to kill them. So that's done. That's done kind of live. So when you're not playing that content, though, is it? are you able to play offline? You are able to play offline, but it is a separate save uh, from your online. Yeah, that's a bit of a pain. I actually remember that Diablo 2 used to do that. I, I had um, a single-player character, and I, you couldn't take them online, which I can understand from that point, honestly, because you'd be able to mess around with uh, clients of the game and be like, hey, tell this chest to drop a legendary item instead of getting the server to validate stuff. So I can understand that for games with a multiplayer component. 
and that, that, that you want to validate that stuff. That case that you just pointed out as well was mm. why um, the division had so many cheaters. Maybe still does. Did they? Because oh, so it relies on client side validation rather than server side. Oh, always validate on the server. Not a problem on consoles, but on PC. Yeah, because on consoles you can't get the software that's going to mess with things. Well, you can. It just takes so much more effort that yeah, so yeah, few yeah. people do it. And when they do it, it's the easiest thing in the universe to detect. Right. Um, but on PC, it was client-side validation for every action in the game. So... Yeah... Some rough stuff. A lot of people complaining about cheaters in the PvP zones and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was PvP is when you're most likely to see it. Yeah. Which I okay. Can I just say mm. that's that's a crazy concept to me. That's crazy. What is that? You're most the likely idea... to see cheaters in PvP. No, no, just the idea of cheating in PvP in general. Or the idea of cheating in a multiplayer game. Like, okay, so you're doing this, but why? Look at the internet and you could ask most people on it, why are you being an asshole? And they couldn't give you a straight I think sometimes answer. people are just bad. Well, I still like I still think it's tremendously, tremendously like bizarre. It is bizarre behavior. Why are you playing this game if all you're fucking doing is cheating? What? That's. I'm sure there are a bunch of reasons, but I think a lot of it comes down to some people just like messing with other people, and even in or even especially if that ruins their fun. And yeah, that's shitty behavior. Don't do it. <laughs> some people just want to watch the world burn. In the words of Heath Ledger's, aka the best joke. <laughs> uh, Jared Leto is a garbage man. Oh, is, he, is that the Joker in the... That's the new Joker, it. yeah, in the in the Suicide Squad. Movie. I mean, I've seen pictures of that Joker, and I'm just like... Mm. Damaged, tattooed to be fair, on his forehead. To be fair, it's an impossible act to follow. Right? I think you could follow Heath Ledger's Joker if you were, say, a Mark Hamill. Well, Mark Hamill's been Joker forever. Yeah, but so you like, could still follow up. You could okay. still follow that. Yeah, I think that there are actors who you could have followed a Heath Ledger Joker with. But Mark Hamill's filming Star Wars. That's fair. Um, anyway, I, re I really like his Joker in Arkham Asylum and Arkham City. Yeah, because he he that. used to do all of the um, voice acting for the cartoon and stuff as well. Wait a sec. Hold up. Wait. Hang on, you just made a connection in my brain like two seconds ago, and now it's clicked into place. Is yeah. That the same, is the same fucking Mark Hamill? It's the same one. Are you shitting me? Luke Skywalker is the Joker. What the fuck? <laughs> yes. What the fuck? Actually, he is. He is. Luke Skywalker is the voice of the Joker. I'm sorry, I need to lay down for about five <laughs> minutes. This it's is true. What? Luke Skywalker is the Joker. Yeah. That's why Batman can never figure it out. <laughs> okay, that bit I might have made up. Um, yeah, Mark Hamill is, well, obviously he's Luke Skywalker, but also he voiced the Joker in not only the Arkham games, but in the Batman cartoon series. What? Mm-hmm. Ah. Oh. He's that's, good at it, right? That's so wild good. to me. I can't. I can't even parse this news. After the after the recording, you should like YouTube it and see if you can find a video of him doing the voice, so you can actually see it coming out of his face. Uh, I wonder if. I wonder if any other Star Wars characters have appeared in video games. I wonder if... Um, well, I mean, there will be Star Wars video games, to be fair. Well, yeah, but I'm talking about just, like, any anything else that a non-Star Wars property. Well, Elon, know, Mc Mark Elon McGregor would... is out, yeah, apparently. He's... What do you mean, he's out? I looked, and uh, he's not in any video games. Oh, okay. 
Um, I mean, Mark Hamill would definitely be the biggest one, I think, just because he's had that history of being the Joker for for a number of years. Yeah. I don't know of any others that have been voice actors as well. I'm not sure. That's so nuts to me. <laughs> this is this is blowing my mind. Well, I've had uh, an, I've had an interesting thing where so I watch um, I'm I'm nowhere near up to date with it, but I watch the old videos more slowly than the new ones. I watch a series called Critical Role, which is a bunch of uh, nerdy voice actors in the States playing Dungeons and Dragons. And it's it's great. It's so much fun. But um, because they're voice actors, now I can recognize their voices in games sometimes. So when I started <laughs> playing Pillars of Eternity, I think it was, I was like, holy shit, that's Sam from Critical Role. Like, <laughs> I recognized his voice. I know that... Um... Jim Sterling, video game critic, has lent his voice to a uh, handful of video games. Um, I know he's appearing as one of the voice actors in Read Only Memories. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that's that's a thing that's happening. I can have a lot of trouble sometimes separating out um, characters in my head when they've got the same voice. Like when I was playing Final Fantasy Dissidia, the main baddie, the god Chaos, his voice... Is oh, what's the guy's name? Sorry, let me just look up the guy's name. Of Keith David, yeah. Okay. Um, but of course, he's uh, Captain Anderson from Mass Effect. So I see Captain Anderson's voice coming out of this like devil person, and my brain just broke. I couldn't understand <laughs> why it was happening. <laughs> um, and then um, when Keith David came on in Community, the TV show. Mm-hmm. I had to, I'd like close my eyes and I'd hear Anderson and I'd open my eyes and I'd see Keith David. It's like, ah! How do I distinguish? I'm also pretty sure that uh, Keith David just appears as Keith David in you... Saints Row 4. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I think you're right. Keith um, David as himself. I mean, he's great. But I first, and he's got a really distinctive voice, right? Yep, I, he I appeared. I confirmed. I have confirmed he appears as himself yeah. in uh, Saints Row 4. Of course, Saints Row 4 does that. But So I'm really glad, actually, that I first encountered him as Captain Anderson in Mass Effect, because I loved those games, and I am glad that I didn't go through them being like, oh, that's Chaos or whatever, or, oh, that's did you, David. Um, did you play yeah, any of the um, Halo games? Um, yep. So I played all of Halo 1, and it's the only one I've actually played the whole lot of. I, I bought it for PC a few years ago now. Mm-hmm. And like I've played bits and pieces of other ones, but I've never owned one. Because uh, he has appeared in every Halo um, from... Oh, no, sorry. He didn't appear in 4, but he appeared no, in 2 and 3, as well as uh, 5. But not Halo 1. Not Halo 1. Is he that um, big flood baddie, the grave mind or whatever? The uh, Arbiter. Oh, he's the Arbiter. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's been so long since I've played any Halo games. Um, I don't remember. I've played that part of Halo 2, but I don't remember. We have lost the plot really bad. That's on fine. This. We've, we've gone on to a voice acting, like... We're just we're on a whole other yeah. thread. Well, let's br- get back to let's get back to Hitman for a second. Okay, sure. Who's, who are the Hitman voice actors of Hitman? Oh no. <laughs> uh, let's let's get back to Hitman and Diablo three because we we really lost. The I plot. can't tell you who the voice actors are in Diablo three. But um, excuse me. But um. <laughs> So Hitman, yeah, it's always it's always online, mm-hmm. and this week PSN, uh, the PlayStation Network, was down. Oh for, shit! Like yes. a couple of days. So it's that... come back up. I I checked when I got home. It's back up now. Okay, but did that just mean you couldn't play your games? That meant I couldn't play uh, Hitman online. Could you I could, could play... you play it offline? Yeah, I could play it offline. Oh, okay. I just don't have an offline save, so. Ah, oh, of course, yep. That's a pain. Um, but I could play everything else that I digitally purchased and stuff like that. Anything that was already downloaded, it's all 
Mm. All fun to play. Okay. Oh, that's not too bad. No, I thought it was going to be a lot worse. It's it's much like Steam too, like where basically everything you have downloaded you can play. Yeah, I mean it's understandable when games that are um, actually online games have are always online and you can't play them with the servers down. As infuriating as it might be, no one's going to expect to play like GTA Online or something while they can't access the servers. Mm-hmm. Um. But it's particularly annoying when games that you can play single player, even if you're playing with what's technically a multiplayer save, but single mm-hmm. player, it's frustrating when those go down when you feel like you should be able to play it, eh? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I ran into a situation where uh, I was I wanted to play Hitman because the new episode has come out and I haven't touched it yet. Mm. And I was like, oh, cool. PSN is down. I can't fucking play this right now. Mm. That's a fun situation. So I ended up I ended up starting Journey <coughs> instead. Sorry. Oh yeah, Journey. I played that. That was a lot of fun. I've actually played yeah. through it a couple of times. Because um, you can play through it in one session if you've got a good couple of hours. But it's a really I, nice, yeah. relaxing game. I didn't have a couple of hours. I played it for about an hour last night. Oh yeah? Yeah, it was just overall very pleasant. Yeah. Just, yeah, I'm, I like Journey. I'm playing it because Hitman was un- inaccessible to me. <laughs> um, video games are good and fun, but maybe we should figure out how we can balance having live content like Hitman does, which I really like. I really like that live content stuff. But we need... we seem to not be able to find a balance between having shit like that and having the ability to play the game always offline Mm. and just use like whatever has been downloaded. I think, um, I think Borderlands two had some stuff like kind of in that, in that sort of vein. Yeah. Cause you could get hot fixes and stuff right down from uh they would do that for borderlands too every now and again mm-hmm. um <coughs> sorry i had to wait for that um borderlands 2 had hot fixes and you know they would just download before the game started up as long as you were connected to the internet right so i wonder if we could adapt a system like that and make it so, like, it downloads new, um, it downloads new kind of contracts, maybe, for Hitman. Maybe not that live content, like the elusive targets, mm-hmm. because I could see how you could manipulate your system clock and stuff like that in order to get more time out of it. Assuming it works but, that way, but yeah. Yeah, it starts at a set time and ends at a set time. No, I mean, assuming it uses your system clock for that. Well, it would have to if it was... Uh, or if it was offline. If it was... Yeah, if it was downloaded and then put offline. Then it would have to go to the system clock, and you yeah. could manipulate that as much as you wanted to. Yeah. But I, th- I, I do think that we could have a balance with it, and developers need to... I, I, I'm going to change that wording there. They don't need to. They really. I I would say that they should, and I would encourage them to find a better balance for uh, their online components and their offline components. I'm not sure quite what that would look like. It's going to vary from game to game, but uh, yeah. Fair enough. I know yeah. that what wasn't the only reason Diablo three was online was. Wasn't it because of the fucking auction house? I'm not sure. I know they got rid of the auction house ages ago. Yeah. Um, so why is it always online still? I'm. I don't know. I'm guessing it's due to similar stuff to what I mentioned from Diablo Two, just about making sure that um, you're not cheating the system because it no longer has separate single player and multiplayer saves. Hmm. Um. I mean, maybe that that thing that you mentioned. You mentioned like kicking abusers out into their own area without telling them. I wonder if 
a bal- a nice balance might be like, hey, you can opt into not giving a shit about having separate saves and just have your single player save available online so that, for example, if you only play with people you know and you mm-hmm. don't care about cheaters, then you can have that available offline. That might be nice. Mm. Maybe. I'm not sure. No? I think I think it could be done, yeah, but I'm I'm not sure. Hmm. Something else um, that you reminded me of just before, when you were talking about Journey, one thing that that game does really well is storytelling without any words at all. Yeah. Um, like it does that really well. But and actually, one nice one nice thing about that, of course, is that it's language independent, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. But I'm wondering, are there any other games you can think of that have done a similar thing where they've um, not had any words in them? I know. I think that um, the game I mentioned before, Kingdom, the only time it had words was well, at the very start where you see the name of the game, mm-hmm. and that's it. And I suppose you probably see the name of the game in Journey as well. But like outside of a main menu, once you start the game, I don't think there are any any words. Do you have any other games that, that do that? Hmm. It's really hard to think of examples of games that communicate like that. Yeah, I'm just going to look through my Steam list while you, while you go. I think, to my recollection, I know that um, Abzu, from the art director of Journey and Flower, mm-hmm. uh, this is a game that was recently released, it's got words for like species of fish and stuff like that, but otherwise it communicates its story without any uh, words or anything like that. Okay. So I'm, I'm curious as to if that would count. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it's, um, if the words it uses are ones that it makes up and doesn't use real words to explain, then sure. Is that kind of what you were getting at? No, no, no. no? It uses, it uses real ass words for like oh, okay. species names and, Oh, okay. I thought it was that like that sort of this stuff, the... but it doesn't use it for any dialogue, as far as I understand. Okay. I mean, yeah, it doesn't have to be the entire game's wordless. I don't want to restrict it too much that you can't think of anything. Mm. I'm having trouble thinking of any other games than those two, um, but I'm having a look. Gone Home and uh, Firewatch are out. So those they're quite use a lot based, of dialogue. They? Those use a lot of dialogue. Um, I mean, most games do, and there's nothing wrong with that, of course. Those, but uh, do the old really Sonic games there. count? Do they not have any dialogue? No. Oh, I thought they did. They got like level, like level complete and shit like that. So like, there was no banter between <laughs> Sonic and Eggman. No, because this is like this is. I'm talking like Sonic One, Two, Three on the Genesis. I haven't. I haven't played them so. Okay, well, the real the real old ones is what I'm talking about. I still thought they would have had a little bit of banter. No, they didn't do that until they got into like the 3D era with the Dreamcast and shit. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, I'm seeing point and click games here, and if you try to do a point and click game without words, that's not going to go well. No, <laughs> probably not. Oh. Sorry, I just noticed that there's like an expansion for Kingdom that I apparently have. <laughs> Kingdom New Lands. Oh, I don't know what that is, but it's in my Steam library. So I guess that was free. <laughs> Limbo. Mm. Limbo had no words. And I wonder if Inside is the same. I've not played Inside. I've seen like vague mentions of it's at least worth a good look, but I haven't... I it. should, uh, I, I have a copy of that. Yeah. I should probably play that. Yeah, you should have a go of it. Oh, here's one. Yeah. This was a bit uh, fun. It's like, um, oh, there's absolutely no story. I think the only words I can think of are in its hard mode where I have no idea what it stands for. It's net. The game is called Luftrausers, and it's like a oh. fake World War II cup type game where you fly a plane around. It's like an arcade thing. Yeah, but, that's, um, um, that's actually by Vlambeer. Oh yeah, it's a lot you of fun. Are. Yeah, they're one of my favorite developers. Um, but Nuclear got, Throne a... would fall into this same camp then. Of course, yeah. 
Um, it's not completely wordless. I'm just going through my list and thought, oh, this doesn't have dialogue. Mm -hmm. But it's got a hard mode called SFMT. I have no idea what it stands for. Googling it has not helped me. And I see that my most recent achievement is, what does SFMT stand for? <laughs> so maybe it doesn't stand for anything. I don't know. Maybe it's a recursive acronym. Like, oh. you, are you familiar with that? Yeah, um, yeah. PNG. Wine? PNG is not GIFs. For what? What? What's the other one? Uh, wine. It's a library of uh, it's a library of code for um, running Windows or other uh, programs on Linux systems. Okay. And it stands for Wine is not an emulator. Uh, so I just picked the W because it worked with the other ones. Yep. Uh, there's a similar one. Uh, I'm trying to think of this. I just I just love the wine one a lot. Wine is not an emulator. Here's mm. one actually that um, I don't think it had no dialogue, mm -hmm. but if it had any, it had very very little. Ronin. Um, I don't know if you've played that one. It's I've not even heard of it. Oh, it's it was um, really good. Steam says I've played two hours, but I've played more than that because I've played a bunch offline. Um, it is a turn-based 2D platform ninja fighting game mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, aesthetically, it's very similar to... Oh, what's that game called? It was on the tip of my tongue just then. Gunpoint. Um, I don't know if you've played that. It's very aesthetically similar, although the gameplay is quite different. Sort of like a cross between Gunpoint and Mark of the Ninja in a way, but its own thing as well. But yeah, mm -hmm. I don't think it has any... I don't think it has any dialogue. I think the closest thing it has to dialogue is the names of of um, characters, but like they're mentioned in chat names, I think. Um, so you're piecing together, and I mean a lot of it's left unsaid, so you can kind of decide what the backstory is for yourself, I suppose. Maybe but yeah, no that's man, one that doesn't uh, well. No Man's Sky doesn't technically have an, any dialogue. It's got a lot of written ones. Oh, no, you can talk to aliens. It doesn't have any voice acting. But, well, neither um, does Morrowind, but I wouldn't say it has no dialogue. I know. I <laughs> this was it was a slip of the tongue. Okay, go on though. Um, don't starve is the uh, game I was looking for. Oh, does that not have any dialogue? Nothing. Oh, I didn't know that. No, it's got no dialogue whatsoever. As far as, as far as I remember, at least, I could be remembering that game very, very wrong. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> I haven't played it, so it's real good. Cool. I uh, I've been meaning to try out one of the other games from that studio, uh, Invisible Ink. Oh, I've got that. It is fun. I do like my turn-based games, um, and yeah, that's pretty good. Um, I think I this is actually one of the few games that I got in Early Access and played it a bit there. I haven't played it as much since it came out of that. It isn't Early Access anymore. It's been released for a while. But, um, yeah, that's a fun game. Um, I'd suggest picking it up. I don't know how much it is at the moment, but... Um, I've already got it's it. It's real nice. Oh, you have got thing. it. Sorry. You probably just said I've that. had it since it was in Early Access as well. Right. I just haven't touched it. Yeah, it's it's good. It's fun. I'll keep that in mind. I, I actually... One thing that I really like about it is it's... Um, it, a lot of it's aimed at avoiding conflict, which is a really nice way to flip things on their heads, on its head. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'll inevitably end up knocking guards out and stuff, but like a perfect run is when you don't get spotted at all. You don't have to do any yeah. of that stuff, which I think is really cool. And it's um, kind of neat and a bit unusual to see a um, turn-based game with isometric maps that generates the maps rather than having a preset set of maps. Um, I suppose XCOM 2 did it as well, but um, I think this is, I think Invisible Link was the first game I played that did it, and it does it to a greater extent than XCOM 2, I think. XCOM 2, I think, has much larger chunks that it pieces together, whereas Invisible Link, it's like the layout of a floor in an office block kind of thing, so they can have a lot more variation in the different maps. Yeah. Man, video games. <laughs> Video games. That's oh. all about. Yeah. Hmm. Do you have anything else you want to hit? 
Um, nothing else comes to mind. Like I said, I've only played really Diablo this week. Mhm. Uh, what about okay, you? Here. I've got yeah? I've got something. Okay. I'm gonna wait for that car to go by. Oh, is it on my end? Mhm. I didn't notice. So, Mark, I got a question for you. Mm-hmm. What makes you, if ever, what makes you want to go back and revisit a game? Hmm. Well, Good question, one, eh? one obvious one is I enjoyed it, but I didn't finish it, which is all too common for me. Um, okay, so let's but, let's just say that you finished it, though. What makes oh, yeah. you go back then? Now, it, it feels like the quote right unquote answer and obviously it's a horrible thing to say right answer the right answer is replayability but no that's not it for me at all um wanting to relive give memories honestly um mm -hmm. that's what brings me back to games like chrono trigger and final fantasy 7 and 10 and 6 which are all games that i've gone back and played multiple times um you know not right one up the other um, and Chrono Trigger, to be fair, does have multiple endings, but I don't tend to, I haven't tried to get all the different endings or anything. Right. But the games that I revisit tend to be the ones that had a really strong narrative that had an impression on me that I really remembered. Mm. I what really go back. Yeah, I, I found myself going back when I really enjoyed a story and mm. enough time has gone past where it's like, I want to experience this again. Yeah. I rarely, like, after I complete a game, I rarely, rarely go back to it and try and get, like, an alternate ending or anything like that. I just kind of leave it for a while. Yeah, I don't think I've ever gone back to try to do an alternate ending. Like, I have long-term plans to replay the Mass Effect trilogy at some point when I can mm. dedicate a solid chunk of time to it. I won't be playing that to do things differently. I'll be recreating my canonical Shepard and they'll be the same person as they were last time because I want to relive that story again. Right. Um, the way I enjoyed it last time. One thing I, one thing that makes me want to do that is I hadn't actually played any of the Mass Effect 3 DLC despite owning it because um, I played mm. through Mass Effect 3 before it was released, before the DLC was released. But right. um, that's the sort of thing that brings me back to a game, honestly. It's always the narrative. Hmm. Is there anything that, uh, like, I think I think it's kind of interesting that we both don't go back and try and get alternate endings. Especially, like, I, I find this is especially interesting with the case of games like your Telltale games. Mm -hmm. Where they're kind of very explicitly designed to offer you a trillion different endings. I don't know if I've played any Telltale games. No? I don't think I have. Oh wow! Yeah, they're probably ga they're probably games stuff. I enjoy. Um, yeah, but but you're, no, I don't think I have. You're missing out on some stuff, dude. <laughs> um, pick up pick up the Wolf Among Us sometime. That game's real good. I think it's the episodic stuff that stopped me from doing it because I don't want to have to wait to continue playing a game. Good so news, the Wolf of Us, yeah, the, I know. the Wolf Among Us is already done. By the time when they're when I see them is when they're partway through so mm. they're not all out whereas dreamfall chapters which i still have on my list is episodic but when i saw that it was already all done yeah i think the final episode of that game came out when i bought it yeah i think it was um, the same for me i think they had it on sale because the final one was out or something yeah and i hadn't um, noticed it before that uh, there's a game that i have in my library it's called kentucky route zero you heard of this <laughs> okay. game Something about the word Kentucky makes me laugh. That's not fair. No, I haven't. Um, maybe it's the association with a certain fried chicken brand. Probably, although like I've never been to KFC, so. <laughs> I wonder uh, if we could get like actual people from Kentucky to confirm if KFC is accurate or not. That'd be great. I think the best thing about K KFC is that Kentucky is fairly close to the sound a chicken can make, like that clucking sound. <laughs> Fairly close. Like, it's not exactly it. Uh, 
but it's okay. close-ish. That, um, yeah, we're going to slip past that, and I'm just going to not acknowledge that you said that. Uh, uh. Uh, <laughs> uh, Kentucky Route Zero has been releasing its episodes very intermittently. Like, talking, I think... There was a year gap, I want to say, between episode three and four. You know, I, I know. Like this of, I know of an episodic game that's worse than that. Oh. Can you guess what it is? No, I actually legitimately cannot. Is that sarcasm? I'm not. I, I'm. I'm also not saying that that's bad. I'm just saying, like that is a situation that I have to deal with. It's it's literally been so long that people assume the next episode will never be released because Half Life Episode Two came out in two thousand seven. Oh, are we st- we still on that Half Life <laughs> Three kick, huh? It, it um, was supposed to be. It was episodic. It was supposed to be. Supposed to be. <laughs> didn't happen. Well, it, didn't happen for long. No. Anyway, there was two episodes for that, and then nothing. For several years. Uh, should we give up on Half-Life 3? Like, well, like, I, is it I, time to move on? I don't still assume it's coming out or anything. It'd be nice, Fair. but eh, it's not going to happen. And is if it, it time does, to give up nice. on um, Final Fantasy 15 ever coming out? <laughs> well, it actually is, though, right? Like, they it had is. a real-life delay and everything. Yeah, I know, right? Um... Final Fantasy XV's been delayed for two months, if you are not privy to this. Uh, this game has been in development for a decade. A literal decade. It was originally announced as Final Fantasy Versus Thirteen. Thirteen Versus, I think, but yeah. But yeah, yeah so it began development before Half-Life Episode 2, Half-Life 2 Episode 2 came out. That's <laughs> wild! Oh, no. Okay, so maybe we still have hope for Half-Life 3. Maybe. If Final, Fantasy, if Final Fantasy can be in development that long, then maybe Half-Life 3 can, too. But where would we go with Half-Life 3? What do you mean? Where would it go? Like, what would... What, okay. Better question. What would Half-Life 3 have to do to make the community at large who isn't like the th- like isn't the PC gaming community may not be familiar with Valve, you know? What would it take to make the general gaming populace give a shit about Half-Life 3? Well, the problem is there's nothing they can do. If it comes mean? out, it'll be a disappointment because it has become a myth. Hmm. So you know, you know than... how with there was so much hype for No Man's Sky, so now there's all these people whining about how disappointed they are. That was always going to happen because that's what hype does. Half Life yep. Three is has got to be the most hyped game there's ever been, and it's like invisible hype. It's community driven hype, and it's because it the games preceding it were so loved and then nothing happened despite promises. So it's the, the hype has reached legendary status. So now anything is going to be a disappointment to that. Now the game just shouldn't come out is what you're saying. Right? Oh, I'd, I'd still play and I'd still enjoy it, but I'd have to accept beforehand. It's not going to be the perfect game that everyone dem- would demand because it can't be. So yeah. Because we have built up a mythos. I mean, of like this from Bell's perspective, it's better to just not do it than to do it and have everyone be disappointed, right? Because people don't know how to accept it's not going to be perfect, right? I don't know. Maybe yeah, I'm just maybe I'm just cynical. People also just can't accept that, like, not every game is for them. Yeah. Like, there's an issue with that, like. A lot of people just don't get that, like, not every game is going to fucking mesh with them. I like that I like that so far I've had relatively good experiences with the games I've played. I don't think I've run into too many games where it was a situation where it explicitly did not mesh with me. 
Um, I think maybe Shadow of Mordor came close when I was playing that through. I will say, though, I did finish that, for what it's worth. <laughs> I saw it through to its end. Um... I don't know. I think uh, hype is real interesting. And it's real interesting to try and keep yourself on the um, the balancing act of hype. Uh, trying to keep yourself... I kind of lend keep my... Your, keep, keep your expectations kind of realistic while still being excited about this thing. I think I learned my big lesson on hype when Spore came out, because I was excited about that game for years, and it was not great um, <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, I had fun with it, but I was annoyed at being so excited for so long, and then it wasn't what I felt like I'd been promised. So since then, I've kind of had to keep reminding myself, like, fuck the hype, you know? Uh, reevaluate mm. what a game's promising you when it comes out. Um... And then I, uh, if you want to enjoy a game, you, you have to know going into it not to expect it to be something that's not. Yeah. I got um, I got into Watch Dogs hype a couple of years ago. Yeah. Back I, when that was, that was announced and coming to release. And uh, I, I really liked what it was putting forward in those initial kind of trailers. I got caught by the Watch Dogs hype as well. I actually pre-ordered it and then got stung because um, Green Man Gaming that I pre-ordered it for fucked up the pre-orders and we didn't get them for a couple of days. I just got stung because the narrative was oh, not yeah. good. And then it was, once I got in, it was like, oh, wow, okay, I hate the protagonist. How's that going to work? Yeah, it's like, Aiden Pierce is an unlikable human. Yeah. Everyone around yeah. him is super cool. Like, I, I didn't get too I far like into that. the story, but as far as I got in was basically his family telling you, holy crap, don't do that, you're a douchebag, and he's like, I'm going to go do that. <laughs> Aiden Pierce, was you are a gigantic douche. Yeah. So, Stop it. So that was a letdown as well. But, I mean, like, that happens. And I know some people who did really enjoy Watch Dogs for its gameplay. Oh, um, I, I'm one of them. I, I was particularly disappointed by the driving. I thought the driving would be more fun and a bigger part of the game than it was mm. but like eh, it's okay and it was just another lesson to me like you know just don't get too hyped about stuff like be, yeah. be excited excited is fine but don't expect stuff to be something it's not don't feel like you're promised something because you know you're never promised something with things like this right promises so made during question. development will be broken except that yeah. let it be what it is so here's a question mm-hmm with this conversation in mind, yeah, what's your perspective on pre-ordering? I don't do it. Okay. The end. How? <laughs> I I I try not to as well. Uh, I'd made an exception for No Man's Sky the, the, when that was released. Yeah. The only cases was, in was which a... I do pre-order games is when it's. Close to release, I'm planning on getting it on release, and I spot a good deal, and I don't want to... Yeah, um, I, I got it that. because it was a week away from release. Yeah, see, when it's something like that, I'm not too fast. Like, um, Monster of Generations, technically a pre-order, but that's because if we didn't put an order in, the store wouldn't have ordered enough games for me and my flatmate and my cousin to all get a copy. And this is the point that I wanted to bring up next. Okay. Reservations. Yeah. Um, I don't buy many non-digital copies of games. Like, that's the only one I've bought in ages because I only need to do it for my um, handheld console. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, reservations, fair enough. Like, you don't want to not be able to get a copy of a game because it's not in stock. That's just shit. Um, but, okay, so now, mm -hmm. it comes to, now it comes to, does that count as a pre-order in yeah. kind of in a modern context. Because um, for, me, for me, personally, I don't think a reservation at a brick-and-mortar store counts as a pre-order, necessarily. The, the way I understand a pre-order is basically, you're telling your shop, I intend to buy this, and you might put some money down for a deposit, and then they'll order a copy, and then you go and buy it. But you could mm -hmm. choose to not go and buy it. So it's not a exactly. pre-order as in the developer gets a confirmed purchase and the money ahead of time. 
Yeah, see, that's this is my biggest problem with digital pre-orders mm. right now. Because you had to pay full price to pre-order a game digitally. Um, and in mo- many cases, there's not really a way to get your money back very easily. Yeah. Uh, with Steam, you have uh, two hours of gameplay. Which you can't have hit if you've pre-ordered that. Hmm? Which you can't have hit if you've pre-ordered that and it hasn't come out yet. Well, I'm saying you can... I think you can cancel your pre-orders on Steam okay. pretty easily. I haven't tried it. I don't know about yeah. any other platform, mm-hmm. but in a sense, you've very much. it very much feels like you've locked yourself in and it requires that kind of lump sum right up front. What I, what I think digital platforms would benefit from is from looking at the model of the physical store where I can go to my local EB... I can put down $10 and say, I would like this video game when it comes out. And they'll order me a physical copy and I get it the day it comes out. And I either, I I can go in and I get $10 off the rest of the price because I've already put that $10 in. Everything comes up roses and I'm happy. Uh, Or if I want... If I read some reviews and decide, maybe this game isn't for me. I reserved it, and I don't think this is going to work out for me. I can just get that $10 back. So the system that I would I would see a digital platform benefiting from what would be to have that reservation system in place. Uh, when the game launches... You if can it's, go. If it's digital, what's the point in reserving a copy? It's not going to go Let out of stock. Let me finish. Okay, okay. It would allow you to preload the game, would be the biggest thing I could think of. Okay. So that if you wanted to play it right away, you totally could. Um, and, but you've only put down $10 on it. So then, uh, then you go to play it. Um, let's, say, let's say you have a week to do this to first boot up the game. So you've had your chance to go read some reviews and see some impressions and stuff like that. And uh, you go to play the game for the first time, and it just says, uh, do you want to activate this game? This will charge the rest of the cost to your account. This is the cost. Uh, Do you want to continue? At that point, you can either get your money back because you've read some reviews and decided, oh, I don't like this. Or you can go ahead and pay for the rest, and the game unlocks instantly like that. I think digital platforms could benefit from a system like that, just from a consumer perspective exclusively. That makes sense to me. That seems reasonable. As, like, I, I especially like the concept of being able to preload. Yeah, and, being know, able to play a, a game, game instantly, like even when you have a digital copy, is, it will be really nice because it's frustrating to have a worldwide digital release and then you can't play it for four hours because you have a slow internet connection. Or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I mean, most most bigger titles do offer preloads nowadays. But only if you've pre-ordered. Yeah, only if you've put down that full price. Yeah. So a reserva- a digital reservation system, I think, could be really handy. Because then you have that benefit of preloading. You have the benefit of being able to pull out if you want to. And um, it, it just feels like it'd be a little bit more consumer-friendly. The hard part then, I suppose, is convincing the people at the other end of that transaction to do it because it's up to them and they're not the one who, ones who benefit. But the world is full of hard problems. Mm. doesn't make me give up, right? Yeah. I think, I think it could work still. I, th- I think it, it's a really sensible idea. Because it's the situation that I'm thinking of is like you don't ever really need a bunch of pre-orders to fund the development of your game. No, that's a bad model. I mean, I suppose there's sort of like Kickstarter stuff. If you do need that, and it's kind of a different thing, it's it's very different. Like it's that's not a that's not a that's not a pre-order. That is an investment. It's a, it's closer to a pre-order. No, a bit though, because if it does go ahead. 
typically you do get a copy of it for yeah, what but you put in. Your Kickstarter It's not a guarantee, but if it no, does go ahead you get it, right? If you are if we are backing something on a Kickstarter or any sort of equivalent, you are investing in the game, you are not pre ordering it, that project is not guaranteed to go ahead or succeed. No, absolutely. But if it does that and you and you kickstarted it, typically you get the game as well, right? If yes, it does you, go yes. ahead. Yes. Yeah. That is typically the case, but again, I want to issue a. I, I want to make, make it this. Super clear. I want to make yep. this stance clear to our listeners that, like, if you are if you are investing money in a Kickstarter, that is an investment. It is not a guarantee that you are getting the video game. A pre order is very much a guarantee that you are getting the video game. And if you can do that, you don't need that to fund the game. And if you do need that to no. fund the game, don't guarantee it's going to come out because that's scummy. I can't, yeah, like, there's, I can't think of a situation like that, no, like that, I, that has ever happened. I don't know of a case where that's happened. I don't think it so has. So I'm, I'm going to assume and hope that it is completely unprecedented yeah. that that would happen. As far as I know, uh, that's the case. So, like, why not do a reservation? There's no fucking difference to, like, anybody involved. Except the consumer who benefits from it. Anyway, this is my... This is my idea for a better pre-order system. <laughs> um, pre-order my book now. <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> I think that's going to do it for us this week. Well, what are you looking forward to playing in the coming week? Uh, this week, I think... I think it's time to get into Valkyria Chronicles. Okay. At long last. I've had that mm-hmm. sitting on my shelf for a while. So I think it's I think it's time. Cool. Um I'm gonna keep my eye on Deus Ex Mankind Divided, because that looks real good. Mm-hmm. But I don't think I'm gonna be purchasing it anytime soon. Um also this week I'm thinking I'm gonna see some uh, more Call of Duty. Some more Persona. I'm thinking I'm going to get some Hitman time in there as well. That's a lot of games. <laughs> it's always a lot of games. With me. It is. It was the opposite for me. Yeah. Speaking of you. I'm probably going to... You going to play anything this week? I mean, I'm at level 69 of Diablo. I know. Ha-ha. Nice. But there's only 70 levels. So, I mean, I should probably hit that. Um, I'll probably try to hit all the season milestones so I can try out the set bonus for the wizard. Um, but I, and like I'll be multitasking all day. I'll probably listen to more Sawbones, um, honestly. Um, mm. But I don't know if I'll be doing, I don't know if I'll be playing anything else. I don't know, this this week and last week, I'm not feeling a huge craving for any particular video game or anything like that. By the way, um, that Sawbones thing mm. that um, Mark mentioned, that's another podcast. It's by... Um, Justin and Sydney McElroy, and it's a medical history podcast. It's really good. I would recommend listening to it, uh, in addition to our lovely show. Uh, just honestly, anything the McElroys do is beautiful. You um, listen to a lot of their stuff, eh? I listen to a lot of their yeah. stuff. So they're, they're, they're kind of um, prolific because they've got – there's Sawbones, and then Justin does a show with his brother's – called My Brother, My Brother and Me, and then he does a show with his family uh, when they play D&D called The Adventure Zone. And then, of course, there's um, Monster Factory, the Polygon video series. Which is the best thing ever. It's your favorite, you, isn't it? <laughs> if you aren't watching Monster Factory, please go check it out. Like it's the name mentions, really they funny. make monsters in um, video games that let you customize your characters and they play as yep, those they monstrosities. Did, um, they did Saints Row, they did Dark they Souls, did. Uh, Bloodborne, The Sims, they did Spore. The Sims, I'm surprised they've ever left The Sims. They did uh, They did The Sims 4, and that was a uh, that was a fun one. Starring the beautiful monstrosities of um, Dark Vader, <laughs> Day Trader yes. Vader, uh-huh. and um, Cousin Special Agent. Uh, okay. So that that's a whole fun situation, and I would strongly recommend 
going to uh, watch that entry in the series. Um, Mark? Yeah? Where can people find you on the intertubes? Um, I'm on Twitter. Uh, you can find me at Honest Universe there. I, um, I blog as well, though not about video games, at honestuniverse.com. I can be found on Twitter at CockatielCutie. Uh, I actually do have a blog that's going to eventually be about video games. Yeah? Yeah, I, cool. um, I did, in fact, throw a new subdomain on my already amazing URL. So nothing, nothing is set up right now, but if you want to follow it on Tumblr right now, immediately, you can go to gaming.bird.school. Nice. Otherwise, you can go to just bird dot school for all of your uh, bird needs. I have a great many pictures of birds on there. Was it cats your thing? I've got that on my Twitter. <laughs> yeah, um, cats. Um, well, one cat in particular. People who park very badly. Oh, that one today looks horrible. That one today, just the worst. Not something I always um, read about, but at lunch today there was someone covering the whole footpath. Yay! Yeah, not pleasant. But um, yeah, that's that's where you can find us. If you want to find the show on the internet, well, I mean, you found it. Good job. It's in your your pod catcher. It's in your ears. It's in your ears right now, presumably. You should get, you should get them cleaned. I think we're talking. To, we are talking to the void a little bit. To be fair, the void has ears too. I've seen them. <laughs> they got weird. Sorry. <laughs> I'm. I. I. You know. I appreciate this surrealist um, vision of the void that you are bringing us, but I don't quite know how to respond to it. My. Uh, <laughs> my untouched by the void brain cannot parse this. You can find our show elsewhere on the internet, though. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. At Podcast Show, you can find us on uh, SoundCloud, soundcloudcom slash Um You can find us on Facebook. Mark, where can people find us on Facebook? Facebook.com slash groups slash Podcast Show. Uh, you can also find us on iTunes. If you want to give us a rating and review, that'd be awesome. And uh, it really helps us get some visibility. Um, and you can find that where? You know that URL? I forget. It was a bit.ly slash something. Podcast dash iTunes? That's it. You yes. got it. Got it in one. It's easy to remember. Uh, wow. Podcast iTunes. Um, I had a look into getting this podcast onto Google Play. If you uh, use Google Play for your podcasting needs, we can't actually upload stuff to Google Play because we live in New Zealand. <laughs> I'm well, that's not a good system. kidding. Great job. Super good. Um, so, yeah, the podcasts apparently aren't available in our country, which is the craziest thing <laughs> I've ever seen. Not great, Google. Fix your shit. Well, if that's the craziest thing we've ever seen, you've lived a sheltered life. It's true. Um, you haven't seen the Void's ears. <laughs> the Void's fucking ears. Maybe I have to um, do that for my D&D game. Maybe not. It's probably not great. Anyway. <laughs> Just make the ever-listening Void. <laughs> hey, thank you. What about a Void that was just all mouths? And they just repeated everything you said back at you. I think that's in the monster manual. Holy shit. <laughs> well, not quite, well, but there's a gibbering mouther. Okay. Anyway. Um, yeah, let's, let's wrap this shit up. I Are think that good? does it for us. Yeah, oh, I think we've that got does... our um, intro and outro music. Oh, yes. I haven't, I haven't brought that up in a while, have I? Uh, our intro and outro music is uh, John Hughes. It is by the band Anamanaguchi. Um, very hard to spell. 
Um, you can kind of guess how it's spelled by googling it, it and giving Google corrects you. I mean, yes, that's that's also true. Ana Mama Gucci. Um, they do some really awesome music. I uh, this song is off of their album called Endless Fantasy. They've also they've also done a video game. They did a video game called Capsule Silence. Hmm. So uh, maybe check that out too, and definitely check their music out because it's real good. I think that's officially everything. Thanks for listening, especially if you've got this far. Yeah, Jesus. Is this a normal, a longer than normal one? Oh, yeah. yeah it's actually yeah, it right is. about... No, no, it's right about on time. Because we had about 10 minutes before our recording where we just... We just, like, yammered about bullshit. <laughs> As usual. That was a... Yeah, I, we always do this. That's a podcasting pro tip. Record a few minutes before you actually start. All right. We'll see you next time. Yeah, thank you for listening, and we will see you next week. Bye.